Um, so officially, good morning, good afternoon. Let me introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Kofi Anitoho, who is a bilingual poet, literary scholar, educator, cultural activist, and professor of literature uh, in African Humanities Institute program at the University of Ghana. Uh, well known for his unique style of performance poetry and CD recordings of his poetry in English and uh, Eve specialized in poetry song, song as poetry, has lectured and performed his poetry globally, published several collections of poetry, journal articles, book chapters, and edited major books on African literature and the humanities. Um, winner of several awards, including the Millennium Excellence Award, it's a liter uh, literature prize. Um, special research areas include comparative literature with special focus on literary and performance traditions of the African world and multidimensional documentations of Pan-African culture and history. And uh, recently was awarded an honorary doctorate by University of Glasgow in 2020 and also elected to a corresponding fellowship of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in February uh, of uh, this year. Um, so again, um, uh, welcome Dr. Anidoho, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for welcoming me into this special session of your global dialogue in African studies. Uh, when I got the invitation, uh, the suggestion was that I should, if possible, focus a bit more on my work, current work, especially the work that I've been doing with creative writing in my own language. So that's where I'm going to start from. Sometime in 2001, I received a late night call from my former professor, Gayatri Spivak, who was on my dissertation committee at the University of Texas, Austin, but was speaking from Columbia University, where at the time she was the director of the Center for comparative literature and society. And uh, she said they were looking for somebody who writes both in a colonial heritage language like English and his uh, mother tongue. In my case, everywhere. And that's how I ended up at Columbia for the fall of 2001 as a Ford Foundation Fellow in residence. It was a requirement that I develop a special graduate seminar for that would enable me to throw some light on the work I was doing, writing poetry, original poetry in two different languages. It gave me an opportunity to reflect much more closely on what I had been doing already, what others had done before me and what others have been doing since then. So I developed a special seminar with the title Bilingual Creative Writing. And I want to indicate that initially when I developed that concept, I was not talking of somebody writing in two different languages. That's the sense in which we often use bilingual. I had developed the concept 
concept based on my own practice and understanding that most of the time when I wrote a poem, ostensibly in English, the very process of bringing that poem into being is a bilingual process. Anybody who knows my language can feel the language, can hear the language in the background. You read Chino Achebe in most of his works, you could feel the Igbo behind the English. You read Amate Edu, yes, you are reading her in English, but you could feel, you could hear her fanti behind the smoke screen of the English language. It was an exciting semester for me, exploring the works of many writers who I believe were doing just that. That men, in many cases, colonial heritage language writers are engaged in a bilingual process, even though the work may come out as a work officially published in English, in Portuguese, in French, or uh, Spanish. And that's the first point that I'd like to put on the table for us to maybe take up during the discussion, the question and answer period. I'd like to pause briefly and illustrate what I'm, one of my very early poems, a song of a twin brother. Because of time, I'll read only parts of it. So many moons ago, before our world grew old, I had a twin brother. We sat the same breast, walked this same earth, but dreamt of worlds apart. And here I am today holding on to grandfather's sinking boat while I chew my twin brother floats on air in jumbo jets and stares into the skies and dreams of foreign ports. Achue, achule. Do not forget the back without which there is no front. Dada is still alive, but grown silent and full of songs sang in a voice the hints of a heart overstrained with the burden of a clan without elders. Our roof is now a sieve, Achu. The rains beat us, they beat us, even in our dreams. And the gods, they say, are not to blame. The state farms have burned the thighs and dug its roots. They grow rice and cane sugar, but oh, Achu, my twin brother, Achu. Our bowels are not made for the tasty things of life. The rice, the sugar, all go to a craft for people with clean stomachs and silver teeth to eat and expand in their borrowed glory. Achue, achule. I shall give your name to the wind. They will roam the world for you. You forget. I chew my father's former son. You forget the back without which there is no front. Papa has lost his war against Henia. And seven Keta market days ago, we gave him back to the soil and Dada is full of Nyaito songs, sorrowing songs sang in a voice whose echoes float into the morning chambers of your soul. And that says the tasty things of life are good. 
But you do not chase fortune beyond the point where all sky bends down to have a word with earth. You do not bury your arm in fortune's hole. There have been others before you, are you? There have been others before you. Amato went away, came and went again. And then he never came. Katako too went away, came and went again. Then he came, but without his soul. Achu, I sit under this oak where you and I once sat and cast carries in the sun. I close my eyes. I give your name to the winds. They will roam the world for you. Many, many years ago, before the silence came, I had a twin brother. We shared the same night, but parted in our dreams. This poem is in English, but I'd like to suggest, maybe even insist, that there is a second, or in my case, my first language lacking the background. Sometimes down to very precise expressions. And you would have noticed that every now and then I'm not able to find a precise equivalent of something in English. So I say, Fofonye Ville. I could have said, My father's son. No, I chose to save to call him by that personal name. So it is a process that did not start with me. Uh, some of the older writers did that. But there were those who in fact chose to write in their first language, an impossible translate into English. And we could think of people like Mazisi Kunene of South Africa in his Zulu poems, uh, The Ancestors and the Sacred Mountains. He would normally write his poems first in Zulu and then render them in English later. Okod Bitek did it in some other fashion. Kofia Wuno, even Christopher Kibu, especially in this last best of poetry before he died on Basel front. So it is not really that I was starting anything new. I was simply following in a tradition that I've seen some great practitioners before me. But you see, with the publication of my second volume of poetry, titled Harvest of Our Dreams. It was one of the last books published in the Heinemann African Writers series before Heinemann was sold to a new publisher who didn't have the same level of commitment to the promotion of African literature. A slim volume of poetry and I found justifiably Related when people said, Oh, I saw your book in a bookshop somewhere in Australia, somewhere in Canada, somewhere in South Africa, somewhere in Kenya, somewhere in Nigeria. 
cousin that suggests that I had become a world poet, <laughs> it's very tempting to play along with that. And I got carried away thinking of myself as a poet who was reaching to every corner of the world. What I didn't realize that in that process, I was marginalizing my own people. So it came to me as a particularly sobering and embarrassing moment when I went back home one day to inform my family that I had been invited to yet another poetry festival. I don't know which one, maybe this was in Rotterdam or some other major world poetry festival. And then my sister had a very simple question. So obviously you must be doing something important for you to be invited to all these places every, every now and then. But tell me, do you think it is proper after we have sent you to school to be doing your work completely ignoring our presence? How come you cannot share your creativity with us? And you are doing it for other people and you are proud of that. So today they ask you to come here, you go and come and go and come. And we have had no opportunity so far to listen to any of your poems and understand them. Remember, you are the son of Abla Adidi, the great composer in our own tradition, who took over from her father, your grandfather, who was also a composer in the tradition. It appears that you have benefited from the tradition that your grandfather, your mother and others have passed down. You take it and run with it and you are sharing what you are doing with everybody except us. How does one respond to that kind of challenge? What was even more embarrassing about it as she pointed out that I know that you can write in the ever language. It's, you are not one of those who go to school and never learn to write their own languages. In your case, you can write it. So why are you not doing any of your poems in ever? To cut a long story short, from that point, I just had to do something about it. That was how come I started trying my hand out in ever poetry. And I was in constant touch at that point, often with my elder brother and mentor, Kofi Awuno. And to our embarrassment, we had to admit that even though we had acquired literacy first in Ewe, because we were not practicing it, uh, the skills in writing Ewe had grown a bit rusty. And there was a challenge of trying to revive your literacy skills basic literacy skills in the language. And then you move on from there to literary skills in order to compose poetry in a way. It may have 
taking a bit of time, but once it got going, I could feel that something important had happened in my life as a creative artist. The first time I shared some of those poems on Ghana television, the feedback I got was extremely encouraging. Not only among my colleagues on campus and others, but you can come with me a week later to a market in Anglogan, far away from Accra, where I was trying to buy some shallots, special type of onions. The woman took the shallots, wrapped them, and as she handed the parcel to me, looked up and saw my face. Lo and behold, this woman, I swear she had never been in anybody's classroom. This woman started reciting lines from one of the poems she had on television. She had never heard the poems before, heard them once as I performed them, and there she was playing them back to me. At the theoretical level, we must recognize that something very fundamental had happened here, that my poems had gone right back into the oral tradition that that woman can repeat those poems and you know pass them on to somebody else and on and on. I get back to the university and there was a young man at my office door the next morning who had a, an interesting request. Uh, please, can you find a way of sharing those poems you performed on TV the other day with us. And foolish me, I said, oh, I'm getting ready to publish them. And you could have seen the disappointment on his face. Publish them, where? The point is that if you put them in a book, I will not have, get them. I want you to add record them for us. This is where the point about using technology to promote our old traditions comes into the discussion. The long and the short of it was that I, it didn't take me too long to record those poems on CD and cassette. I deliberately refused to publish them in a book until just about now, more than two decades later, those poems are now about to be released in print. But in the meantime, they have circulated all over a different world, a world which now includes my own people, not my Hanuman African, you know, literature series book, reaching the whole world, which somehow did not include my own people. Uh, we should attend to that world also, but not at the expense of our own world. This is my argument. This is my, my humble suggestion. But above all, that's what we need to do to promote our own languages. If we do not write in our own languages, the languages will not grow. 
we all know the story of Shakespeare. Or some of us may not know the story that if he had gone on to the university, uh, he would have been taught to write in Latin or Greek. Well, let's see, think of what he has done for the English people, for the English language. And along with many other writers, we must be doing the same thing. It is not enough for us to be complaining of how some people came and imposed their language on us and on and on and sitting back and not doing anything about it. Yes, something can be done about it. And as I said, others have done it before me. If our Sutherland would normally always write first in the Fanti language and take the trouble to translate those things into English because you also recognize the need for the works to be available in English as well. But she was not about to do the English one at the expense of uh, doing it first in her own language, which is a point that people miss about Googie's uh, promotional work for work in African languages. People are always criticizing him, and, you know, uh, but it is not that she, Boogie and others are saying, let's write only in our own languages. Otherwise, why would Boogie write a big book of about a thousand pages in Gikuyu? only to spend the next two years translating the same book by himself into English. It's because she, he recognizes the need for the book to be available in English at first. And initially, he got help from people like Wangui Wagoro, who translated some of the earlier work for him, but he gets to the point where he thinks he must be translating the works himself as well. Could have spent that time writing another, another novel or play, but, but the need for them to be available in English is recognized and so he would spend time uh, doing that. Let me point out that once I got into writing some of my work in Ebe, uh, it reconnected me to the oral tradition in ways that I found so far very, very beneficial. One, the need to recognize that performance is an important aspect of poetry. Secondly, that in our traditions, quite often poetry is song and song is poetry. And that was a new dimension to my work, which I really didn't stop to think about when I was writing only in English. The moment I started writing in a way, these two dimensions to poetry, the performance, performative aspect of poetry, poetry as an art of performance, as a performance art, but also poetry as song 
song as poetry. In fact, the word for the poet in the ever language is heno, hano. Literally, from two words, the first word is ha, which is song, and the second one, no, which is mother. So the poet is the mother of song. The poet as one who gives birth to song. You know. We may remember the story by Okot Bitek when he said he went to his mother very excited about the song of Lawino. Say, mother, mother, look, I've written this song, song of Lawino. And then the mother says, well, can you sing it? Sing it, let me hear. And it says, oh, mom, we don't sing this one. And the mother says, oh, what kind of song is it that you cannot sing? Then it is not a song. Why are you calling it a song if you cannot sing it? poetry as song. In our traditions, the poet is not only a of words, but also of music and that extra dimension, I must admit, is one that I'm still working at. I'm watching my time and uh, I need to leave as much time as possible for the interview session and also, but I have to put this in. In 2007, I was asked to write a poem to mark the 200th anniversary of the official abolishing of the Slave Trade Act in Britain. And I was asked to write the poem and perform it as part of, very, of a very elaborate program at the Elmina Slave Castle. The final lines of that poem goes something like this. There is darkness still in our mind, but dawn cannot be too far behind. There is darkness still in our mind, but dawn cannot be too far behind. And I was rehearsing this poem by request with one of our hip life artists, younger artists, popular artists. Those lines struck a particularly important chord for him. And he says, Bro, we, we have to sing these lines. We have to sing them. It's not going to be enough for us to just recite them, no, we must put those lines to song. And I spent three days, three nights agonizing about how to turn those lines into a song. Until one night, the third night, I said, ah, how about if I render them in ever? The moment I rendered the lines in ever, I was surprised that I was able to find an appropriate tune and melody for them. And the song came. The lines, Chiziga Doremi Agu Avajagodo. Chiziga Doremi Aguna Gama Jelu 
Chiziga dorevi aguna cavajelo. Chiziga dorevi aguna cavajelo. Chiziga dorevi aguna cavajelo. Oh, Chiziga dorevi aguna cavajelo. Chiziga dorevi aguna cavajelo. There is darkness still in our mind, but dawn cannot be too far behind. How come that I could not turn them those lines into a song when they were in English language? But the moment I turned them into my own language, it was easy for them to become a song. I believe I've answered that already. But it is possible for the poet to be a singer in our own languages, but in a borrowed language, that is very difficult to achieve. I must also add, before I give time for the interview and question and answer period, that when I've started writing seriously in Ewe. I actually began, began with poems I had already written and published in English. Several poems from the harvest of our dreams became poems in Ewe. Except for one thing, I did not approach them as Exercises in translation. The poems had a life of their own in English when I created them originally. The every versions must have their own life and with some advantages that probably may not have been there when I first wrote them in English. I gave them as much room to draw on the artistic, linguistic, aesthetic norms and traditions and techniques of poetry in every. The result, I can say this without any hesitation, is that many of those poems are richer in the every version than in the English, the original versions that I wrote in English. Uh, those who can speak both languages, understand both languages, have always confirmed this claim uh, that I'm making. I was teaching a class at the University of Lomé. That was a time when I was invited there every year to do a special seminar in African poetry. And across the border in Togo, where the Ebe language is actually the major language. And the students had a chance to listen to a particular poem in English and they enjoyed it very much until I played the audio recording of this same poem in the Ewe version. And the students started shouting, say, oh no, this is a real poem. I'm not sure what that means for the original one that I wrote in English, which had also been enjoyed by the same students until they heard it in Ewe. And then they are now saying, this is a real poem. Uh, maybe I'm getting carried away dramatizing this point, but there is something to say for a poem in its original language with its own traditions and aesthetic norms and linguistic conventions and whatever. I like with your permission, the moderator to 
to pause there, not to stop, but to pause there so that we can turn it into a dialogue. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Igodo. Um, I'll now invite uh, Sinfri to pose a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said at the beginning, um, this is one of those awkward sessions for me because um, uh, Kofi Anido taught me uh, literature when I was at the University of Ghana. So um, when I was preparing for this session, I wasn't sure what posture I was supposed to adopt, uh, that of a grateful student, that of a colleague, or that of a professor somewhere, but anyway, it would be a mixture of all three. Um, Kofi, thank you very much for uh, all that you have done, um, particularly to some of us. Uh, let me ask you one question. From the way you were talking about uh, writing in EVE, for example, you give the impression that you feel much more enthused, much more liberated and uh, creatively enriched when you are writing in EVE. Is that the case? Do you feel um, much, more, much more liberated? when you're writing in ever, even though, of course, you, you do write in English as well? The answer is simply, yes, I do. You do? OK. But, All right. but I must add quickly mm -hmm. that that does not diminish my contribution to the other side. Yeah. Yes, it doesn't yeah. diminish my my, my determination to continue writing in English. I have invested so much, so much of my life. In <laughs> yes, okay. it, it doesn't make sense to throw it overboard like that. Okay, okay. But then you see, the, the most intriguing statement you made to me was your definition of bilingual creative writing. That yes. even if you are writing in English, there is a background to ever um, in your own writing that somebody who knows ever can feel the ever texture behind your English. So yeah. to some extent then, all your writing has been in ever. Right. But even if you're writing in English, the issue is that there's still a background in Eve. So you have not succeeded in breaking away from Eve, even when you are writing formally in English. That's true. That's, that's the point, the, the argument I'm making. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm suggesting mm -hmm. that this is nothing peculiar to my work. Yes, yes. yes. I've seen it, we all have seen it happen with a Chino Achebe. Yes. Uh, the English language and the interaction mm. between the English language mm. and the Igbo language in his work. We've uh -huh. seen the, with the Shoinka, the interaction between uh, Yoruba and, uh, you know, we've seen it in uh, Gugi Wathiongo, in Kofi Awuno, Amate, mm -hmm. you name them. Mm. 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 Then the, my, my next question then is this. Um, when you follow that line of, uh, of argumentation, what becomes interesting, what was interesting in listening to you was the, the way you were making it clear that some of the distinctions like poetry, song, et cetera, which may exist in English, uh, collapse when you move them to every, because you're talking about poetry as song, song as poetry, meaning that the, Theoretically, they, we need another brand of aesthetics to handle these categories that are emerging, for example. For example, you are saying that poetry, song, song is poetry. Um, whereas, for example, I guess in formalistic English, song and poetry will be slightly different. So you are suggesting that some of the binary distinctions we may make 
in English will not apply if we're going to develop an African aesthetic. Am I getting you correctly there? Yes, but let's remember that mm -hmm. again, uh, this particular phenomenon is again not unique to African traditions. Yeah. As a student of literature, of linguistics, mm -hmm. you know that this was the case mm -hmm. for traditions of poetry yes. in England, in Scotland. Yes. yes. The Scottish. Uh, Popular ballads. The poet yes. was was a, an itinerant what mm, mm. singer. Mm. His poetry performing the poetry, the accompaniment of what a musical instrument as you move yes. from community to community, mm -hmm. and then you know writing technology takes kicks in mm -hmm. uh, in the period of what. The printing press, uh, mm -hmm. making print as the norm now, yeah, as yeah. opposed to what was there before. Mm -hmm. uh, it just so happens that we in Africa, maybe partly because a big chunk of our population have not been introduced yet to what the, the word as print. So we are still holding on to what? what? The verbal, oral, performative traditions mm -hmm. uh, for our poetic work and storytelling and everything. Then um, what about you, your intellectual imagination and creativity when you are working and writing as a literary scholar, do you sometimes write in ever or you write in English so far? Do you have um, articles, let's say, about African poetry that you've written in ever or so far, you, the main emphasis has been to write about African poetry, African literature in English? Then I'll follow up what the implications are. Yes, uh, uh, most of most of my scholarship so far has been in English. It's been in English. Okay. So I'm currently facing an interesting transition point uh -huh. where I'm about to release my first published or printed collection of poems. Yes. All those other poems I've been writing over the last two, more than two decades. Yes. I made a point earlier that I deliberately held back from what? Printing them. Mm -hmm. And I've given them a life to circulate and interact yes. with audiences as oral art. Yeah. And I think that has made its point already Mm -hmm. So I'm about to release them in print. Okay. And I had to write an introductory essay, for instance. I couldn't have <laughs> written the introductory essay in English. Mm -hmm. So that's a new journey I'm starting on now. Okay. okay. Far, far, far behind what Ngugi has been doing all these years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what... Uh, what I found quite moving was the anecdote that you told of this woman at the market, at Makola Market, who could recite um, some of those lines of your poem, which gave me the impression that there is much more room and interest in engaging with materials produced in and about Africa. If, that, if it is rendered in a manner that is uh, accessible to the wider African audience. The fact that this woman could repeat to you, could recite back to you the lines from your own poetry meant that she was really engaged or she and other people were really seriously engaged in, in your work. And I can see why you ultimately, why you took the advice of your system that um, 
you can't be a global scholar who alienates and does not serve the interests of their own local community. And I can see mm -hmm. the, that it makes a lot of sense. And usually it makes a lot of sense to listen to sisters. They, they give you a lot of good advice as well. You know, there is an even more intriguing dimension to that point. Yeah. The poetry that I've written in a way. Yes. The only people who have asked me to explain any details in them. Yes. Have been my colleagues with their PhDs and the, <laughs> <laughs> the so called ordinary ever speaking guys who have never been in any classroom. Mm -hmm. They are excited about the way I've used the language. Yes. yes. Uh, they are excited about it and they understand it. Yes. Sometimes maybe even better than myself. <laughs> And yet, every now and then, colleagues who are even PhDs in English or in li literature, in linguistics, they are asking me to explain. You see, it's because they can't capture the poem, the holistic impact of the poem, which is what the other people that you meet in the markets can do. Um, yeah, anyway, this is, this is fascinating. But uh, it's up to you to, uh, to invite other people. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Rob. This is wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank, thanks, uh, yeah. uh, We have uh, um, a couple of comments uh, thus far. Um, let me start with Adrian. Adrian is touched by the uh, humility and yeah. shall we say responsiveness that comes through in your practice and uh, Adrian is particularly touched by that mantra of yours never write at the expense of one's own background but then follows up with the question how do you see the dilemma of language choice playing out in the practice of uh, Francophone um, African writers and gives the example of uh, Senghor and a few others. Um, the sorts of practices that you have just discussed, even being at the background, even when you were writing in English, to what extent do you see that reflected in the work of Francophone African writers? Well, I can say that even with the Francophone writers, we have to be careful not to put all of them in one basket. Okay. Even Senghor. <laughs> there is an undercurrent of what? African rhythmic beats that ran through his poetry, even Senko, the man who confessed, I don't know whether it's a confession or, you know, a terrible statement, it says uh, French is the language of the gods and uh, <laughs> that he dreams in French, uh, even for him. <coughs> There is a trace there, but there is there's other Francophone writers who are in touch with their own traditions, uh, including linguistic and musical traditions. And you read their French poetry in French or drama in French, even prose in French. Uh, you only have to read and of course, he's big on what? The value of our own languages. So it's not surprising uh, to find the same trace of 
one of or you know in, in some of what he has written in in French. There will be a few others that one could talk about uh, for whom the argument I'm making will, ap to, will apply at least to some degree. Okay, um, Adrian has a second question. Um, Adrian wonders whether there are things that uh, you can ontologically feel in an African language, but which you cannot translate language. And I take that to mean perhaps a non-African language. Are there things that you ontologically feel in let's say they, but which cannot easily be translated into um, a non-African language? I think there is abundant evidence that this is the case. That's why every now and then, in like the poem I read parts of, why did I retain African expressions for some of the things? When I say, Achue, the name is Achu, the name for what? A twin brother. But when I say Achule, I'm calling him from, from a far distance. Achu is at the other end of the world. Yeah. And nothing can, you will need a bundle of words to replace what? The lay, <laughs> you know. And when you go into African music, you will note that that technique is there at the end of many musical lines, lyrics. You know, uh, the reaching out across time and space to Fufunye Mvi means a lot more than what? Brother. I could have used as in the title, Song of a Twin Brother. But when I get down to the proper reference, I say Fufunye Mvi my father's son. You know, it means more than a brother. <laughs> Daniel Ville, my mother's what? Son. Again, that also means more than what? Brother. So yes, uh, there are those nuances, ontological and otherwise, which can only... One of our colleague poets here have said it, uh, better than I'm, uh, I'm, I'm fumbling to, to respond to. Our Ghanaian brother poet, Kobna Iyakwa, in one of his poems said, there are some things that can only be said in song and in a mother tongue. For us as African writers, uh, there are some things we can only say in song, and especially only in a mother tongue. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, there's a question from uh, Caroline. Um, Caroline wonders if you have any recommendations for encouraging Eve speaking children to create poems, maybe given the ups and downs of the um, policy or language choice in schools. Any recommendations for encouraging Eve speaking 
children to create poems in Ewe, given um, the policy on language choice in education in Ghana? The recommendation I have is not so much for the children. <laughs> it's for, for us, their parents. <laughs> <laughs> And their teachers. <laughs> Incidentally, that is also why I'm turning more and more attention to our writing for children. Oh. My last published book was a play for children. I spoke about my poetry for uh, poetry, you know, for the adults. It's coming out from the Bureau of Ghana Languages with a play for children. If we can do more of that and make them available for our children, uh, not just everywhere, but in Chi, in Yoruba, in Zulu, in any of our many African languages, we must be writing for the children. And that is uh, something that we cannot run away from and stop putting the blame on them. The children will learn to speak the language that we, we give them uh, an opportunity to learn. Okay, thank you. Um, there uh, a number of colleagues who would um, uh, uh, post questions to you directly. I have uh, Oyeronke, uh, Sangita, and Edwin in that order. Um, Oyeronke? Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, I shouldn't say good morning to Professor Aidoho. I'm assuming he's in Ghana. Thank you yes. so much. Yes. Where, where else do you expect me to be? <laughs> I know. As he's saying, so great to hear you, to listen to you. So, such a productive engagement. And I have to say that a few years ago, uh, a young Cuban woman excitedly embraced me when she heard me speak in Yoruba and said, you mean you speak the language of the gods? I said, yes. That's the language of Oshun, that's the language of Ogun, that's the language of Yemoja. I could go on. <laughs> so unlike Senghor, right? <laughs> so the language of the Orisha. So I really appreciate that. But my question is this, uh, uh, as a gender scholar, I appreciate your insights and experience about what, what it is that African languages bring to the table and how our languages inform English. But there's a distressing other aspect going on that I see as a gender scholar. You find African writers of different genre translating our traditions into English and in the process, part of what they do is to create male dominant traditions in English in ways in which our languages do not do those gender categories. And I'm especially talking about uh, Yoruba, which, uh, and I, I find Yoruba, to be, some people might say, an ex extreme case of non-genderness in language. There's no he, she, there's no son, uh, daughter, and all that. But suddenly when you see people translate things from Yoruba into English, women have disappeared. They no longer exist. It totally distorts. And you can imagine how distressing it is in, in, a, in a tradition like Ifa, the spirituality, many of the cl clients, need I say most of the clients are females, 
mothers going to inquire about their children. Many of the, um, the, the diviners historically were also female. But part of what you see with this linguistic he, with this linguistic English imposition and, and, and romance languages imposition of gender, what you see is distorting of the language itself. And then they re-import it into the language. So my question is this, what has been your experience of gender as you write in ever, as you write in English? And I am also curious, particularly about the poem you recited about the twin brothers, because I know that there are a lot of things in, in, in that are close between Eva and Yoruba <laughs> in terms of traditions. In Yoruba, uh, twins are not gender specific. Even the names we give them is the same Taiwo Kenti. We don't have some big theory about you having two boys or two girls. We just have all this wonderful mythology and practices about twins, whatever their anatomic combination. So please, could you speak to your own experience of translating ever and the whole issue of gender? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my sister, they, <laughs> first of all, with regard to the, the particular poem, uh, it was a poem that was addressed to Kofi Awuno. And that explains why <clears throat> Emphasis there on you know twin brother. We are not uh, we are related, but not uh, twins. But the point you've made about gender terminology in our languages it goes deeper even in many of our traditions. The creator. is male, female. The ga was a ata na, ata na nyongmo. You know, and the male, female thing is recognized there. The same for the ever. Mau Sogo Lisa, and I said, Go Lisa. And then at the level of you know personal pronouns, uh, you have the neutral, uh, that's for a human being. And, uh, so I, I'm I'm curious to see how somebody would translate that or rather mistranslate that from Yoruba into English and make it gender specific uh, with the disappearance, as you put it, of the female uh, gender in the translations. Uh, it, it can only be an act of what? Extreme uh, carelessness if we if we are prepared to practice that kind of violence on our own languages in the process of translation. Translation requires some very deep levels of being sensitive to the nuances of both the source language and the target language. And uh, it's not something that you could do carelessly and achieve you know, significant results. Um, 
Can I please say one more thing? Can I please say one more thing, moderator? Yes. yes. Thank you for that answer about it, it would involve carelessness. But I think my comment goes to the whole issue of the ontological nature of a particular language. Yes. People are not particularly careless in English when they translate all pronouns into he. I call it the ubiquitous he. They don't, you don't even have to think about it. And I think even in, uh, in Chino Achebe, this has happened. So that instead of saying one thinks that people just say he instead of one, the neutral. Because mm -hmm. it's as if English pushes you in that direction. And you know, for a long time, feminists fought over what they call the general uh, universal man, right? When in the English language, they will use man <laughs> and say, oh, it includes everybody. And I think many Africans have taken those, those ancient, terrible male dominant linguistics linguistic um, <coughs> attitudes from English, from the Romance languages, they have taken it in, even as English itself is now trying to decolonize gender within itself, right? The Africans won't let it go. Some of it has to do with the ontological nature of mm -hmm. Western languages. And I'm, I, I'm, some linguists can even speak to that because I'm curious to how this gender thing becomes, became so deep, so deep in them. For example, in French, if you have 100 women in a room and you have a little boy, they'll, they'll refer to that crowd as he. <laughs> Those are the ontological things that, that, that people have digested from, from uh, Western languages, and, and we need to pay more attention and, and work against it. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sangeeta? So thank you very much uh, for a fascinating and personally framed talk, and also your dialogue with Sinfri. Uh, much food for thought there. I have two questions and I could take them one by one if it's okay for the chair. Um, my first question relates to writing in multiple, writing or publishing in multiple named languages that are a person's uh, multiple mother tongues. So I feel very comfortable with your push towards languaging in multiple named languages. Uh, I grew up with many languages around me, both at home and in the schools that I attended. And in my work today, I publish in new languages that I learned as an adult and older languages, but also in a signed language. So my publications are available as videos, for instance, in Swedish Sign Language. So my question, this first question is, why two named languages and not more? Is there a monolingual view of understanding mother tongue here? Is Eve the, the only named language that you grew up in Ghana? So, so I'm trying to and, and, I, and I grapple with this in my own writings, are when we talk of mother tongue and when we push to some kind of an on, onto epistemological sense of languaging, are we kind of falling into the pit of that there is something that is homogeneous within the nation state? So could you, could you reflect on that? And if you want, I could pose my second question. Basi, is that okay? Okay, yeah, maybe there could be connections between both questions yeah. and you can just take them in one fell soup. Okay, so my second question relates to uh, what, what um, your sister triggered for you with regards to understanding your writing. And, and that touched a chord with me um, because I'm thinking of, 
isn't writing for others also something that scholars face more generally and perhaps from a class and migratory perspective when they confront writing in another shara that is a scholarly shara i think many can relate to the fact that they lose their own families when they author scholarly in the named languages that they share with their families so so while you make a very good point of the the duality that you faced in your sister's um challenge to you isn't this also a challenge of writing in another genre within your within one named language thank you for the for the two questions uh because i framed the presentation around my own experience and practice uh i had to limit some of my main points to my own uh work in relation to the english language on the one hand and then the ever language on the other no the situation for ghana as for many other african countries is the multiplicity of languages that we have to deal with and that has generated an argument with people suggesting that why only in you know that isn't it better for us to just go ahead and hold on to the english because uh there are just too many languages which one do we choose uh but quite frankly the point is that in many situations now multilingualism rather than say by or even mono seems to be the the more reasonable option as many languages as we have uh, need to be paid attention to and at one level this might be expensive but in the end it makes the investment pays off at any rate many quite a number of languages are dying off in some parts of africa for lack of use in the case of every language it has a one particular advantage it's one of the a number maybe not so many african languages that cut across uh, more than one national so called national boundary every is not a majority language in Ghana in terms of numbers is i think the third or the fourth the largest linguistic group in Ghana is the akan or the akan group but it is the largest linguistic group in in togo across the border and spills over not only to benin but when i travel by land from ghana i'm not lost until i even i cross into nigeria around the badagri area i can still understand a bit of uh, that's the, the the eastern limit of the ewe uh, territory ewe speaking territory 
So in terms of uh, the significance of the language measured by numbers, and uh, it's important for language for a language like ever to be uh, uh, to receive attention from the educators and, and the, but it's not just for the larger groups even for the smaller groups if it is possible we need to pay attention uh, every language that we lose means the loss of what the whole culture the traditions of knowledge that go with with, with, with that language I recall that we were in Eritrea not too long after it gained its independence. And we were there specifically to discuss the language issue across the continent. We were informed that in the period leading up to the drawing up of the constitution for the new nation, the single subject that attracted the most intense and longest debate was the question of language. There were those who were pushing for the choice of one particular language, local or, you know, language of colonization. But eventually, it was agreed that every one of their languages deserved attention. And this was translated into policy for education and policy for information or syllabi in the schools, or textbooks. So for all subjects, any textbook that was developed was immediately translated into the eight or nine or so languages that were spoken in, in the country. Initially, it sounded a bit challenging but we were told that the first generation of school products who benefited for, from this language policy in terms of their productivity as workers in the labor force, they were performing at such a higher level of productivity compared to the previous generation uh, that did not have this uh, option that had to be educated to a very restrictive language policy. It became very clear quickly that in every investment uh, into that policy of promoting a plurality of languages for the nation uh, was not a waste, but rather an eventually beneficial investment. And uh, we, we have been spoiled by our uh, colonial uh, orientation to the question of languages. Where you go to some people, you don't pay attention to the language that they're using and you expect them to drop their languages and then take yours. That attitude is, is playing into our national policies as well. And, have been very limiting. 
people talk of a, a major experiment that was held in, in Nigeria some time ago. The mother tongue education, Yoruba, I think it, it was uh, a policy that if, uh, they fed, uh, a particular age group was determined that they should be taught the experimental group. We had an experimental group, and then they, you know, one group was taught every subject using the Yoruba language. <coughs> the other group, the old colonially inherited practice of using English for teaching all languages, all subjects. At the end, of, I don't know whether it's the primary or secondary, the primary level, those who were taught using Yoruba as the primary medium of instruction were consistently performing better, the higher level in every subject, including English. The result was very unmistakable. Why it never became a national policy, uh, I don't know why we would let such a valuable lesson fall by the wayside, just like that. It was clear that as far as education is concerned, uh, it's more effective if carried out in the child's uh, primary language. And that child would be. Two weeks ago, you know, I, a colleague of mine was telling the story of how In the university community, fortunately for him, he and his wife have the same first language. And even though they live on the university campus and in the urban area, they refused absolutely to speak any other language to their son as he was growing up from babyhood to childhood. And then it was time for the child to go to what? Uh, kindergarten. The teachers, when they interviewed and started speaking English to him, he spoke back to them in a way. As for me, I don't understand that language. And the teachers were reluctant to take him. It felt that he would become a problem for them. Eventually, they were pers persuaded to, to, to admit him. At the end of the very first term, the teacher came looking for my colleague to confess that by the end of the very first term, he was the only one who was <laughs> reading and speaking English properly with all the grammatical rules observed. And he had come in with only the knowledge of Eve. The other kids grew up in families where they were being spoken to in English, and yet they couldn't uh, show as much uh, progress as this child who had a solid 
foundation in his own first language and made rapid, you know, uh, progress in acquiring, in this case, the second uh, language which happens to be the foreign language. He was already speaking at least one or two other Ghanaian languages as well. Your second question is what remains the outstanding challenge to all of us, how we could go beyond the creative writing area into formal discourses, scholarly and public discourses, uh, without marginalizing our people. But I think the politicians are setting the pace for us, even though they will not encourage the promotion of, you know, our own languages formally. They perform a miracle when it's time for campaigning, political campaigns. They know that the campaign will not go anywhere if they continue speaking big English. <laughs> They'll take every opportunity to address the people in their own languages. That's how you get your votes. And in this case, it is we, the scholars, who have to catch up with the politicians. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot for the answer. So as we begin to draw the curtain, um, I'll just take two quick comments from uh, Edwin and from Gabriel. Edwin? Yeah, um, thank you, Professor Anido. Uh, it's, it's a privilege to hear you speak. Um, I had two quick questions. First of all, I, I wanted you to highlight a major challenge that you faced when you were translating your poetry from English to ever. And a general advice you give to young um, um, poets who would want to write in their own local language because the stakes are high in this context of writing in English for visibility. People would, pre would prefer to write in English because it, it, it makes them more visible. So I want to ask these questions, the advice and the major challenge. The major challenge is just simply this, that many of us acquire literacy only in English or French. And therefore do not know how to write. We, we may speak our own languages fluently, but the skill of learning to write in our own languages is not one that our schools have taught us. Uh, some of us had a, a special advantage there. That at the time I went to school, I acquired literacy first in every. And indeed learned to read many of the major European and other, you know, writers. So I first read Shakespeare, many of the Shakespeare stories in every. French classics, Greek classics, Arabic classics. Uh, I went to school at a time when all, many of the major classics had been translated to every, and that was what I learned to read first before I started learning to read English. 
as another matter. So if you haven't learned to read and write your own language, that's the first major obstacle. Fortunately for me, I had already acquired that skill as part of my formal education, but it had fallen into disuse. I had not been using it. And therefore I had to revive my skills of literacy in every, in order to take, you know, do effective creative writing. The second point to make is that, as I said, I did not try the poems that I first wrote in English. I did not try to translate them into English, into every. Somehow that translation process had already happened when I was what? Writing them in the first place. I was translating many expressions directly or indirectly from Ebe in order to get the English text written, uh, which wouldn't be a perfect, you know, the results would not be particularly outstanding, but you now start translating the English text into Ebe, that will just, cause further disjunction. So I take the poem and uh, reconceptualize it in what? Ebe. And give it the advantage of exploring the resources of the Ebe language and linguistic traditions uh, as fully as possible. So Okay. Well, thanks, uh, uh, um, Gabriel. So, Nietzsche, thank you, you all. Uh, delightful moment for us. <laughs> I, I, I took a long to, uh, to log in because of my department meeting here, but it was also fantastic to hear you. Uh, I'm going in the same direction as did uh, Professor Enkelumi, uh, that, uh, that's about the language of the Orishas, language of Eshu, language of, of Eshu, Oshuma, Eshumare, language of Oshun, of Ogun, because uh, here in Brazil, you know, we have uh, lots of traditions that came from Africa, from enslaved Africans. And those old traditions now are being studied. And when we, uh, in linguistics, it's looked at uh, those traditions, they usually go to analyze structure. <laughs> and that's um, what I, I think it's difficult because it's hard to follow to analyze structure only because as you are uh, saying, Professor uh, Kofi, we have, uh, much beyond of structure. And one point we are analyzing, and I, I'm specifically concerned with now in my research, is about silence. Because uh, in, in Black diaspora, uh, silence uh, meant more than uh, humiliation or uh, oppression. It, it was also a, a strategic way to resist the other, the, the monolingualism of the white people, all the way they forced us to speak their languages. How do you interpret uh, this, this silence in your point, in your poetry, and uh, in your translation? As we have here in Bahia, Ewefon, or I don't know how to say that in, in African languages, because I here we call Ewefon, Ewefon uh, traditions. Here, Ewefon traditions are committed to uh, uh, sometimes to fool the colonizers with silence to say in the Candomblé religion uh, under the secret, under the, the, the appropriate way, uh, African, African uh, sentences or African languages in New Form, for example. How do you uh, understand this concept of, of silence in that way? 
Thank you very much. Well, that's a very deep question. Uh, the role of silence in in the diaspora is one that has to be explored carefully uh, because if you're not careful, you may mistake it for what? Lack of knowledge or even ignorance. No. Uh, as, as you point out correctly, it's a particular form of what? Resi resistance. You keep silent over something, but you should not forget. You, you know, it's not forgetfulness. And uh, there will be an appropriate occasion to unveil the silence when that occasion comes. Uh, the silence could be broken. But before then, it's best not to break the silence. The The diaspora has the advantage, I don't know whether to call it the advantage of, of drawing on several linguistic and cultural traditions. We mentioned the candomblé. Uh, on the surface, the dominant traditions you will see there uh, would be Yoruba. But in my own experience of visiting Brazil quite a few times, I was also quite struck with the presence of what? Every four traditions, which are already quite closely re related to, to Yoruba. In other parts of the diaspora, the Akan, the Akan tradition is strong in, in some places. Uh, what our generation must do if we understand the role of silence, uh, in the history of survival in a slave and enslaved uh, culture is for our generation to establish a line of communication with the knowledgeable people who know so much but for various reasons, I've chosen to be silent about them, to build sufficient trust for us to open channels of communication so that we they can open up to us for us to receive some of that knowledge before the aspects uh, begin to disappear one by one and then completely. Yes, the silence may have served the purpose of preserving knowledge that may be very crucial for our survival. But if those who know begin to disappear, begin to die off one by one, it becomes necessary that the rest of us earn enough trust from, from, from them 
for them to open up and speak to us and confide in us. And we in turn treat that knowledge with sufficient what? Circumspection and not uh, run around. One of the problems with us as scholars is uh, we might be too tempted to you know, let people know that ah, we have discovered this. We, we have gotten access to this new knowledge. Uh, that will break you know, the trust and then we will not get more from those sources anymore. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Zaido Ho. Um, on this note, we'll have to say a very big thank you to you for sharing your expertise with us. Um, we like to also thank uh, the audience for staying on and for the lively set of engagements we've had. Um, um, Kim, would you like to tell us who our next uh, speaker will be? Yes, so next Friday, September 24th uh, at 9 a.m. Uh, U.S. Eastern Time, we'll have Nikolai Karkov and he'll be talking about Eastern Europe, anti-Black racism and the unfinished business of decolonization. So the title is different from the one we've previously sent out so we'll get uh, more information from him and send it along to you guys before next week as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Thank you. Thank you, the audience. And we'll see you next Friday. Well, thanks to everybody for 